Subtick and movement in CS2 are not a good combination. Last time around, we have demonstrated how subtick based movement is always slower at tick boundaries, which might offer a possible explanation for why movement in CS2 feels sluggish and like you're stuck in mud. However, this was disputed by one of the guys whose work about subtick I used as a baseline for my video, which in turn was disproven by the guy who fixed sprays with his analysis of view angles proving that the acceleration in between the interpolated movement in CS2 is indeed inconsistent. We have more or less come full circle again. So this time we are going to deliver a practical proof of how subtick movement is actually inconsistent and needs some fixing by implementing a reproducible and automated experiment. The setup is rather simple. All we need is a ledge where we can fall off, a character, something to automate our inputs, and finally some good old math to verify our hypothesis. Basically, what we are looking for is to run towards the ledge and stop as close as possible to it by doing a perfectly timed counter strafe. Now, in a consistent system, this sequence of actions should always lead to the same result. Well, more or less as we will see in a bit. So, to start off, we need to determine how far away from the edge our character needs to be placed for a predefined sequence of inputs to not fall off at the end. Fortunately, I already did the math for acceleration based on the leaked CSGO source code in my last video. So all that's left is to calculate the travel distance per tick and add everything together as well as to do the same for deceleration from full speed when counter strafing. Same as last time, I did the math and confirmed the velocity values in game after. This gives us four pillars we can use as a foundation for our experiment. One, it takes 35 ticks to reach max speed with your knife out, which translates to an input duration of 546.875 milliseconds. Two, the total travel distance during that time frame are roughly 98.17 units. Three, it takes 8 ticks to fully decelerate and come to a standstill when counter strafing, which is equal to 125 milliseconds. 4. The total travel distance during the acceleration phase are roughly 15.58 units. This makes the character placement fairly easy. First, we determine the last walkable coordinate on the ledge, which happens to be negative 791.97 in the y direction for CSGO and negative 791.99 for CS2. Then we simply subtract the two distances from before to get our final starting position, right? Well, not so fast. We are actually going to use one additional tick of movement for both the acceleration and deceleration stage, which I'm going to explain later, increasing the total input time to 36 ticks or 562.5 milliseconds and the travel distance to 102.08 units, while having no effect on the travel distance during the deceleration, since we are effectively accelerating back to where we started from. Using these numbers, we can now calculate the final coordinates and end up at negative 905.76 units. With the position down, Let's talk about the input automation. To repeat the same sequence of inputs as precisely as possible over and over again, I used auto hotkey and looked at a script posted by ValveDev in a Reddit thread, ironically also concerning movement inconsistencies in CS2. This script makes all inputs accurate within a window of two milliseconds, meaning they are two milliseconds short, spot on, or two milliseconds late. So each input has the set input duration we determined before, but sometimes plus or minus up to 2 milliseconds. Meaning we need to understand how this uncertainty could potentially affect our measurements. If we draw a graph of the calculated input timings over time in ticks, we can see that in an average case, the counter strafe is performed between tick 36 and 37 meaning some of the deceleration has already been applied at tick 37. However, there are some edge cases we need to consider. First, let's assume our input was made in under 2 milliseconds after tick started. If we then also get an unlucky roll for the timer, 
where the input duration is 2 milliseconds shorter than intended, the counter strafe will be performed between ticks 35 and 36, meaning at tick 36 we have already decelerated a bit and the total travel distance will be shorter than what we calculated initially. No biggie though, since we won't fall off the edge here. But second, what about if the input was performed a bit under 2 milliseconds before the end of a tick? Well, if we again get an unlucky roll for the timer and the input is extended by 2 milliseconds, we end up between tick 37 and 38 for the counter strafe, which means one full additional tick of movement at full speed, or in other words, we are going to fall off at the end. While this is some nice theoretical stuff, we also want to verify this in the practical stage later on, so I quickly calculated the odds of falling off the edge. The probability of falling off is the area of a tick in which the worst case might happen, meaning 2 over 15.65 times the probability of getting an unlucky roll of plus 2 milliseconds for the timer. Since the timer is independent of the ticks before, it is simply the probability of one of the three possible outcomes of the timer, so exactly one third. And this brings the final probability to 4.27%. Now let's do the same theory as before for subtick movement. First of all, we need to get rid of the ticks in our drawing, since the subtick system was designed to translate real world inputs one to one into the virtual world in terms of their input duration. So the TLDR is in a tick based system, you can only have inputs with a duration of a multiple of the length of a tick. While with subtick, your inputs can be any number and correlate exactly to how long you press the button on your keyboard. Coincidentally, this also makes our calculations a whole lot easier. First, the calculated travel distance remains the same since we have chosen an input value that perfectly aligns with a 64 tick system and the same applies to the deceleration as well. For the edge cases, we again have three outcomes, but they are much less complex this time around since we don't have to consider tick timings. First, we roll an input duration of less than or exactly 562.5 milliseconds, in which case we stop approximately on the edge. Two, we roll an input duration of more than 562.5 milliseconds, in which case we fall off. Three, the probability this time is just the second part from before, meaning we are supposed to fall off about 33% of the time. Well, now it's time to verify every bit of theory we just came up with by running the experiment in CSGO and CS2 respectively. And as expected, in CSGO, out of 50 tries, we fell off twice, or approximately 4% of the time, which checks out nicely. For subtick in CS2, it's the same story. 50 tries and the character fell off 17 times, which translates to roughly 34% and also checks out. Great! So up to this point, the experiment just shows that you have to be less precise in Cisco to get to the same result, since the tick timings make for a more consistent experience as they are acting as an input window of a few milliseconds that you have to hit instead of taking the exact timing like CS2 does. However, everything we've proven so far is that subtick is working as intended and the inconsistent movement is just a skill issue, since you have to time your inputs down to the millisecond to get the same result. Now, in my opinion, this would make sense if the performance wasn't utter trash and the game hadn't frequent frame time spikes of over 10 milliseconds, which effectively prevents you from doing any inputs in that time frame. But the experiment doesn't end there. There has to be a reason why the movement is considered to not be as sharp and consistent as CSGO's implementation across the board. So to continue where we left off, what about taking the worst cases for both CSGO and CS2 into consideration and adjusting the starting position of our character model accordingly, which means the probability to fall off the edge in either game is precisely 0%. Just as a quick note, from now on we are not testing the systems against each other anymore, but simply try to prove their consistency within themselves. Starting with the tick based model, we have to adjust the starting position by 250 units per seconds times one tick, 
since, as I mentioned before, an input duration of 2 milliseconds would be considered as having happened over an entire tick, which is simultaneously the reason why I opted for an additional tick of full movement, as shown in the beginning. So, the new travel distance for the acceleration are not 98.7 in units anymore, but rather 102.08 units. Next, we repeat the same approach for subtick, except this time actually using the 2 milliseconds and not a full tick, since the movement is supposed to be more precise and doesn't round your input duration to the next highest tick interval. This brings the final travel distance during the acceleration slightly up from 98.17 units to 98.67 units. So let's see how both systems are performing now after adjusting everything for the worst case. In CSGO, to the surprise of absolutely no one, the character model didn't fall off a single time over multiple runs, meaning the mathematical model behind movement in this game is consistent and predictable. But for CS2, for whatever reason, the character kept falling off multiple times, even though it shouldn't, which doesn't make any sense. I had no idea what is going on, so I simply kept increasing the worst case duration by 2 milliseconds all the way up until reaching a full tick. And throughout my runs, the model kept falling off until an extra buffer of 12 milliseconds was reached, at which point it consistently stopped before the edge and succeeded in the experiment. Now, why the behavior is off, I can't explain, but it leaves us with three possible conclusions. One, the movement system in CS2 is inherently inconsistent and needs some fixing. Two, the entire subtick system is flawed and doesn't work properly since it very obviously doesn't stick to its premise of translating real-world inputs one-to-one -to, -one to in-game inputs. 3. Something in my model, math or testing setup is wrong and subtick actually works as intended, making my setup an outlier. This possibility is impossible to disprove myself which is why I invite every one of you to fact-check my stuff and run the experiment yourself. To make this as easy as possible, I have uploaded everything involved to my Google Drive and linked it in the description. If you find anything or have any questions, you can simply add me on Discord and write me a DM. So yeah, that is pretty much all from my side. If you enjoyed the video, you can leave a like or subscribe to my channel for more CS content or click the video to your right, YouTube thinks you're likely to enjoy as well. As always, have a great day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!